Hello and welcome to this third episode of the CoLab cast from our studios in Clearwater, Florida. I'm Executive Director Christina Baker and I am really excited about today's guest. So let's get going. No, 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 we're good. So typically at that point, I read a bio of our guest and Frank was kind enough, our guest today, to give me a really long bio. So I'm going to start with that, but uh, bring Frank into our conversation um, because it's got a lot of good talking points that I'm going to need his help on explaining what half of this business means. So first of all, the, I mean, the second word of your bio is salami. Uh, yes. Frank Salami. How do you say your last name? Celebi. Celebi. S-I-L-E-B-I. Correct. Okay. Where did salami come from? So I got the call sign salami when I was flying T2s in Meridian, Mississippi. Um, you know, one of the rites of passage in naval aviation is that your squadron comes up with your call sign. Um, so my last name is Celebi, and there's no other meaning for salami other than it rhymes with my last name, <laughs> although it's usually a good topic of conversation. At the um, bar? At the bar, yes. Picking up Salami, chicks. yes. That's my call sign. <laughs> um, so I got it when I was flying T2s. Most of the, my other friends, they'd get their call signs for training, and by the time they got to their fleet squadrons, their fleet squadron would reassign their call sign, and they'd get some other new call sign. You know, like, for example, in the Navy, you can never have a guy whose last name is Johnson without his call sign being tiny. Um, mm. So other call signs are a little more um, uh, creative. Uh, mine just happened to rhyme with the last name. And so that's all, that call sign followed me for my entire Navy career and never changed when I, once I got into my fleet squadrons. Okay. So in case you haven't put it together, Frank uh, is a retired Navy fighter pilot. Naval aviator. Naval adi- aviator. Excuse me. Yes. So, okay. All right. So we've. I'm. I'm. I got through the second word of your bio and needed. Uh, needed some clarification. Only a thousand more to go. All right. I know. So like, let me skip to three, four, five, six. The sixth word is uh, where the city where you were born. Uh, yeah. And h- how in the world do you say that? So I was born in Barranquilla, Colombia. Um, that is about an hour away from Cartagena. Uh, so, which is, Cartagena was big Spanish uh, port. Remember, that's where the Spanish took all the gold and everything out of, uh, and emeralds out of South America. Gotcha. And Veracruz was Mexico, and then Havana's where they all met, and then they left to go to Spain. Anyway, so I was <laughs> born in Barranquilla, Colombia. Uh, moved to the U.S. when I was five. Okay. Uh, my dad came to study school at Lehigh University. And so that probably leads you to your next question. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So I'll pick it up from there. Uh, in 1988, Frank received a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Mechanics from Lehigh. Is that from Lehigh saying? University? Lehigh University. Yeah. After working for General Electric Nuclear Energy in San Jose, California, for two years, Frank accepted an appointment to the Navy's Aviation Officer Candidate School in Pensacola, Florida, and was commissioned in March 1991. So. You got your degree, immediately started working for GE. Yeah, I was actually going to go to graduate school, and uh, I just had about had it with school at that point. I got through college in three years, and uh, I was just, you know, I had a professor lined up to go to graduate school and, and stay at Lehigh and keep studying. But then I started getting burned out, and I just needed a change. Uh, and so I sent my application out to a couple, uh, a couple of companies. GE was one of them. Polaroid was one of them. Thank God I didn't get that one. Um, so uh, and uh, I, I got an offer from GE Nuclear Energy in San Jose. And the reason I took that one was because it was coupled with um, um, a program where they would let you get your degree at Berkeley. And so you get your master's degree in engineering. And they would pay for it, and they would pay for your whole salary while you were going there. Um, so I took that one so I could go back to school at some point and, and finish up my master's at least. Cool. So officer school. You went straight into officer training. Yes. Yeah. So uh, why the change, I guess? Yeah. So uh, 1989, uh, the Oakland A's are playing the San Francisco Giants in the in the World Series. And so here I am in my office in San Jose, 
and it's a big cubicle area. There's a little little itty bitty office where I worked for a group called Vibration Technology. Again, not associated with my call sign. Um, but I worked for a group called Vibration Technology. We would put little sensors inside different components of a nuclear power plant. We would test them when they were new, and then we would test them when they were older, and we could tell if they were going to break or not. Anyway, big earthquake happens like 5 o'clock, uh, 5.07 or so in the afternoon, and the tiles start to, to fall from the ceiling. The floor starts undulating. You know, Usually there's two different kinds of earthquakes. There's like shaky, shaky ones, and there's rolling ones. Shaky, shaky, not a big deal. Rolly ones, those are the ones that flex the buildings and they have problems. So it starts shaking and then it starts rolling. So I go underneath the table, a bunch of tiles fall. I walk out, you know, it's dark. Um, all the tiles are on the ground from the ceiling. So I, I go out to my car and my five mile drive, which used to take 45 minutes, um, took me about five minutes to get home, 10 minutes to get home. So, you know, you walk out to your car after a big you know, earthquake like that and you think, emergency broadcast system. It doesn't work. It needs electricity, and there was no electricity. So I wow. uh, drove home. There was no no lights, no nothing. So it was a quick drive home. And so then the big thing was the aftershocks, and I thought to myself, you know, I always wanted to fly an airplane, and I've never flown an airplane uh, other than being a passenger in the back. Um, so I was like, I could have died, and I've never flown an airplane. So the next week, I started calling around, and the Navy was the only service that would guarantee that I was only applying to be a pilot. So I applied to be a, a pilot in the Navy, and they, I got accepted in January. I applied in November. Uh, I got accepted in January, and then I waited from January to November uh, of 1990 before I actually got into AOCS. And what is that? Uh, Aviation Officer Candidate School. You ever okay. watched the movie An Officer and Gentleman? Yeah. That so, was you? No, that wasn't me. <laughs> But uh, Officer and General actually takes place in a town called Port Townsend, Washington. Right. Uh, that school for the Navy actually was in Pensacola, Florida. Okay. Uh, run by Marine Corps drill instructors, just like in the movie. Um, and he still did, at the time, we still did the Dilbert Dunker, which I always wondered why we did the Dilbert Dunker, because there have never been a survival of an ejection seat aircraft ditching at sea. So it's like, hey, we're going to train something that will never actually happen. You won't be able to survive. But we're going to train to it anyway. Uh, which is pretty standard for the Navy and the military. Hurry up and wait and train to things that will never actually happen or work for you. Okay, so that was like two years? Yeah, so um, you know, obviously uh, November of 90, I go into the Navy. I get commissioned. Um, uh, actually, my commissioning day is March 22nd, which is my brother's birthday in 1991. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have to wait until August of that year to start flight training. I went up to uh, Whiting Field just north of Pensacola. Uh, to do flight training, I did the uh, flew the T thirty four Mentor. It's a single engine turboprop, and then from there I went to Meridian, Mississippi, where I flew the T two and the A four. Uh, the T two is a twin turbojet trainer, and the A four uh, received its notoriety from being um, uh, a light attack aircraft in Vietnam. It was the it was the kind of airplane that John McCain was when mm -hmm. um, the Forrestal fire happened, um, and in that one, rockets actually hit his airplane. Uh, because at the time, they didn't thermally protect bombs um, or rockets, and they cooked off under the heat of the exhaust of other airplanes and fired into some other airplanes. So it was a big fire that the Navy had. Anyway, uh, I digress. So <laughs> None of that is in your bio. Yeah, no. Got, I got winged in May of 1993, and I did get my call sign when I was flying T2s there. So May okay. 1993. Wow. Okay. So give me some, uh, let's talk about frame of reference, what was going on in the world, and 1993. Uh, I'll tell you what was going on in the world in 1991 while I was in AOCS. Um, the first Gulf War started. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember that the drill instructor brought us into the one room, turned the TV on, showed us what war was all about because you can see all the AAA going up, and it was an air war at the time. Uh, and then he said, all right, get down on the ground. Give them. In other words, he wanted us to do push-ups and mountain climbers and exercise, <laughs> even though it was like, Three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. Uh, so and that was, you know, thirteen weeks of having fun like that. So did that scare you? I mean, what were you, what was going through your mind? So for, hold on, how old were you at that point? Um, so what was I? Twenty three. Okay. 20, yeah, twenty two, twenty three years old so at the so time. So you were a kid. I was a kid. I graduated from uh, Lehigh. I wasn't even old enough to drink yet. Um, so I grad. I was a little young in my class, and I graduated at Lehigh in three years. So mm -hmm. a little on the young side to begin with. Yeah. So. Uh, but yeah, I, I didn't, I've never thought about, 
you know, getting shot at or death or anything like that. You know, when you're young, you're invincible. Right. Well, you know. Did your parents have anything to say about your choices at that point? No, my mom was always worried. I mean, she's a, you know, Latin American, Spanish mom. You know, Italian moms like to feed you. Spanish moms like to worry about you. <laughs> I'm sure all moms worry about you, but, you know, so. Okay, so 93. So in 93, I got winged, um, and I selected A6s. Uh, A6s is a medium attack um, uh, bomber, all carrier-based, obviously. And so if you ever watched the movie Flight of the Intruder with uh, William Defoe and Danny Glover, okay. um, they were flying uh, an intruder, an A6. Uh, as a matter of fact, flying in the squadron that I, I deployed with, VA-196. Um, uh, later on in life, uh, when I was flying Tomcats, uh, one of the, the skipper of the base, Captain Benson, he said to me something that was very interesting, and it was, uh, we breed our own replacements. So, like, your kids are the ones that replace you. And so he lost his son um, in a mid-air collision off the coast of California, and I lost four friends in that mid-air. Um, but his son had obviously taken up after his dad's and his dad's footsteps and flown Super Hornets uh, when that happened. And then uh, via 196, uh, my department head, uh, my boss, was Steve Nakagawa, and his dad, Gordon Nakagawa, was the commanding officer of that squadron. And Gordon Nakagawa had gotten shot down in Vietnam while he was in that squadron as the executive officer. Mm. So a uh, long line of... Uh, and the Gordon Nakagawa's commanding officer when he was there was a guy named um, 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 Admiral Bull. And so Admiral Bull's two sons end up flying. So, you know, it's a very tight wow. community. So you see a lot of... You know, familiar yeah. relationships there. So, I, when you first started that um, conversation, you said you chose this because it was a midsize. So you're able to select which aircraft oh, yeah. you want to fly? Yeah, so that's always needs of the Navy first, and then whatever okay. your desires are second. Um, so I can tell you that, like, in Whiting Field, you select it whatever platform you, you want to uh, have. So the selection you have after your primary flight training is jets, which are all carrier-based, um, E2C2, uh, which are uh, twin turboprop airplanes that will also land on the carrier, um, helicopters, or what they call big wing, which would be like the P3, they're land-based, bigger airplanes that go anti-submarine, electronic warfare kind of stuff. Uh, and so from there, I selected jets, and I went up to uh, Meridian, Mississippi. Um, when you get winged, then you say, I want to fly A6s as my first choice, Tomcats as my second choice, Hornets as my third choice. And then they say, okay, we're going to send you here. Uh, I, I picked A6s because my brother was actually stationed in Woodby Island. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to go up to Woodby Island where my brother was stationed. And he was actually a plane captain and enlist, he, was, he was enlisted in the Navy. Mm. And so he was supporting some of the aircraft up there. Um, so I went up to Woodby Island and I flew A6s out of Woodby. Beautiful area, the so Northwest. Hey, how big is an A6? Yeah, you have to ask me a question like that. Yeah. I want to say it's something like um, 56, 60 feet wingspan and like a 55-foot length. Okay. So it's not super huge, but it's not small either. And how many, like there's pilot and co-pilot? Pilot and co-pilot, side by side. Side by side, yeah. okay. Um, you can carry, uh, let me see, 6 times 5, 30 minus 2, 28 500-pound bombs. They take two off because they hit the doors. The, the doors. Now, if you took the uh, main mount doors off, you can put the other two bombs on. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever bomb anybody? In the A6, I didn't bomb anybody. Um, you know, we, we did, like, Operation Southern Watch in Iraq, uh, but we didn't go in there and bomb anybody. The, we had a big strike that was planned. Uh, I remember going in there, and we were going to strike a surface-to-air battery that they had up there, and there were six airplanes going in. I was number six. And I thought to myself... Uh, I guess I'm number six because I'm the junior guy, so I'm the most expendable out of all of them. So, because <laughs> by the time the uh, first five fly over the target area, the hornet's nest has been stirred. Yeah, and so that's when all their surface air kind of stuff will come up. But, but that that strike got canceled, so I never actually okay. did that one. But you, of course, did practice runs. Oh, lots and of them. Practice targets in the ocean and all that good stuff. Yeah, lots of them. Uh, you, 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 you know, like. People don't realize, like, when you're going to go to a carrier, I can tell you that before I went to the carrier for the first time, I probably had 600 landings under my belt. Wow. You know, and and 400 of those landings were strictly practicing landing on a carrier box. So what they do is they paint a carrier landing area on the runway, which is only on half the side of the runway, right? And so you practice landing on that little in that little box. 
Okay. And what are those tethers that go across? Yeah. What is that? Just a cable? Arresting cables. Yeah. They're about um, an inch and a half in diameter. Um, And they're actually made up of a bunch of smaller cables that are all, um, you know, uh, braided together, together. wound Mm -hmm. together. Um, And then, you know, those guys, after every landing event, they'll go through and inspect them. And if, like, one's broken, it's okay. If, like, two of those little itty-bitty cables are broken, that thing goes over the side. Wow. You know, they remove that, and they just they just pitch it over. So practice <clears throat> for that, you had four hundred on land. That was just to go. That was just to go landing on the carrier for the first time, mm-hmm. only during the day, uh, and I got good weather. Yeah, good yeah, weather. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, just like ideal conditions because mm-hmm. it's your first trip out there, and so uh, I remember my my first carrier landing. I remember, but I can tell you, I don't remember anything about the boat because I was just so focused on landing the airplane, getting it into that area. Yeah. And if you ever watch, like, uh, uh, guys on the carrier and stuff, and you see people running around in yellow shirts, Mm -hmm. because they're all color-coded shirts, the guys with the yellow shirts are the ones that are actually taxiing the airplanes. Nobody else is allowed to. Mm. Uh, So, and those guys will yell at you and stuff. They're the the only ones that will yell at the pilots for not listening to them, (laughs) because it's really tight quarters in a carrier, um, and... Uh, those guys have to make sure you're not going to hit another airplane, not going to hurt anybody. Right. Yeah. So they're responsible for you while you're on the deck. So one thing that I recently learned from you is when you're in layman's terms, when you're coming in for a landing on a carrier, you have to come in at full throttle. When you land, you go to full throttle. Right. Yeah. 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 So, um, so if in case you miss, then you can pop back up and you're okay. Right. In case you miss, it's, it's called a bolter. Oh. Yeah, and uh, for the record, every landing you do on the Navy is graded. And if you don't maintain a certain boarding rate, you know, like arrested, you know, mm-hmm. so if eight out of ten times you have to stop on the deck, right? Um, and if you don't maintain a certain grade point average, so like a, a good pass is a 4.0. An average pass is a 3.0. Um, a crappy pass is a 2.0. So who's grading you? Uh, they have landing signal officers. So when, when you see a you know, movie of the guys landing there in a carrier, off to the left-hand side, you'll see a couple things. You'll see a white ball with two rows of horizontal green lights. That's called the ball. It's a Fresnel lens. And just in front of that, there's a platform with a bunch of guys wearing white jackets. Mm. They're white float coats. Those guys are all greeting you. Mm. And let me tell you, uh, their eye is impeccable. Like, if you're just a little bit high, like five feet high, oh, they can tell. Mm. You know, it's because they've seen, they've been trained, um, their eyes get trained so well, they can tell when you're high, they can tell when you're fast, they can tell if you're out of sync with the deck, like if the deck's heaving or whatever, mm. and they can take control of the pass and tell you if you're high, if you're low, you know, if you need to come right or come left. So when you're coming in for that landing, uh-huh. what speed are you flying at? Uh, it depends on the airplane, but usually about 135, 140 knots. Okay, which is 1. miles 1. an hour. 1.15 miles 300 per miles an hour? No, no, no. 1.15 miles per miles per hour to the knot okay. right so 15 percent more okay so if i say to you 130 knots 135 knots i'm really so talking about 150 miles an hour okay so you go from 150 miles an hour down to zero in a couple seconds two seconds yeah so it's like the ultimate brake check yes it's the ultimate <laughs> if you slammed your brakes on your car as hard as you could you would not be slowing down as fast you get you so know, put that, into your straps, and then you go to full power in case you miss something. Right. But you're already at full power by the time you're getting thrown into your straps anyway. Okay. And what kind of, like, you've got chest and neck straps. Like, is there anything holding your head in place? No, not really. Your uh, head just thr- thrusts forward? Yeah, your head just thrusts forward. That sounds uh, but you do have, really um, fun. So you, you actually have, like, a, um, uh, it's not a five-point harness. It's actually a six-point harness, if you will. Um, and you're connected with things called Coke fittings. Um, so the, the top two on your shoulders are connected to your parachute, which is connected to your seat. Uh, and then you have two around your waist. Uh, so you're wearing a harness, and the harness has got these fittings that you're clipping onto the seat. So the top two get clipped onto the parachute that's part of the seat. Uh, the bottom two get clipped onto a seat pan that goes with you if you ever eject, mm. right? It actually leaves like the seat. Like a flotation device? And it's got oxygen in it. It has a life raft in it. It's got some other safety equipment on it. Um, and then your legs actually have leg restraints. They get clipped onto the seat, so when you eject, they reel those things in so that you don't hurt yourself. Wow. Yeah. I can't yeah. even. That is so crazy. Okay, what's the scariest moment 
you've had flying? Uh, scariest moment. I've had a few. Uh, let me see. When I was flying A4s, um, you know, in the Navy, you have this old saying, John Wayne in the break, Shirley Temple in the groove. So when you come in to land at the ship, the ship wants it to land like as fast as possible. They want to minimize the amount of time that they're, they're traveling before they've recovered all the aircraft. So you come into this thing called the break. Um, so you fly in the same direction the ship is going, um, right above the ship at 800 feet. And then you're usually coming in at like 500 knots, you know, 550 knots. And then you bring your throttles back to idle as you do a really hard G turn, you know, like, like a lot of Gs. And the Gs, they make a lot of drag, so your airplane slows down. So by the time that you're rolling out, going in the opposite direction of the boat, so you're doing like a 180 degree turn, you're about a mile and a quarter uh, from the boat, uh, from, the, from the path of the boat, um, and you've gotten your gear down and you're slowing down to 150 knots, right? And so I need you to send down to 600 feet. So anyway, so you do a lot of these practice landings. And so I was flying A4s, this is my first really big scare. I was flying A4s and I came into the break and I'm 500 knots. I'm like, that's right. I'm badass. I could fly this airplane with the best of them. So I come into the break, and the A4 was single engine, and the engine took a really long time to spool up. So I roll out in the groove, and my engine's at idle, and I bring it up on power, and it's not spooling up as fast as I think. And so I see the ball, which is like one ball high, and then it's then it's right like parallel to the to the green rows of lights, which tells me I'm on glide slope. Then it's one ball low, so I'm probably about 50 feet low or so at the start. And then it's two balls low. And when it goes to two balls low, it turns red. And then I see it flashing red, which means I'm below that. And so uh, the LSOs, they waved me off because they were you know, grading the landings and stuff. They waved me off. And uh, I can tell you my heart was racing because I was not in control of that fall, you know, as the airplane was racing towards the ground on extended runway center line, right? And this was on a carrier, no, or, this is on land. Th- oh. Yeah. Well, then what was scary about it? I almost hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, another scary time I had was, uh, so. So hold on, let's finish that. What happened? I got waved off. My heart was racing uh, like nobody's business. Just like I was completely petrified at that point because I had no power on the airplane. And the airplane was falling out of the sky really close to the ground, like extended center line of the runway, right? So luckily the, the engine spooled up and I put my speed brakes in and that was enough to get me away from the ground. The LSO said that they saw the dirt flying from the ground as oh I started climbing gosh. away. So Okay, all right, yeah. scary time number two. Scary time number two. Um, so I was flying Super Hornets um, and I was actually doing a check riot for a guy that was doing a... Um, um, advanced uh, type scenario where he has a lot of bandits out there and he has to manage um, a strike path. What's a check ride? Um, so as, as you progress through the Navy, you get more and more experience. And so if you're ever going to lead like a large quantity of airplanes, like 12 airplanes, 16 airplanes, to go in and actually do a bombing mission, um, you have to understand where your where your flight is, all, all members of it. Mm. You know, you have electronic attack guys, you've got bombers you've got fighters and so he's the guy that's managing the entire strike okay and so there's a bunch of bad guys out there i think there's like eight and this is there were like eight bad guys out there and some of the bad guys they were just hanging out at a certain place making believe that they didn't know there was somebody coming in um and some of the bad guys were running opposite the route to see if we would you know what we would do so this is a real life scenario or this is a training this is a training okay yeah so i'm flying night vision goggles one thing about night vision goggles is you have no depth perception so, like, if I see a light and the light's five miles away, that light can be 50 miles away, and I just see the light. I can't tell that it's mm-hmm. five or 50 miles away. So I have to look under, underneath the night vision goggles to see really how far it is. So I was flying high and right, and I was looking down. There was three of us in this flight. So I was the high right guy. There was a guy in the middle. And on the opposite side of me from that guy, there was a guy that was below him. So as I looked down my left side, I could look through – the lead was in the middle at the wingman on the other side who was below him, right? So it was just one straight line down there. So I had a guy in the back seat, and I'm trying to tell the guy in the back seat what to tell him so that he's so he's aware of where the bad guys are. Because on my airplane, I'm in the network. I see where everybody's at. Mm-hmm. And his airplane was an older airplane. He was not in the network, so he couldn't see all the bad guys. So you know, I'm 
sort of busy. I'm a little overloaded with, you know, trying to manage helping this guy do his check ride right so he passes it. And the guy in my back seat is sort of junior. And so I look down, and there they are. And I look down again. There's I can see the one light, but I can't see the other guy. And what happened was I was drifting down and left. Hmm. So I literally almost hit the guy that was between us because it was just one straight line between, you know, going looking straight down. And so uh, when I realized it was underneath me, I could literally at night see in his cockpit, I could see his hands on the throttles and everything Whoa. as I lit the afterburners off and pulled up. So that was another scary moment. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right, yeah. moving on. Yes. Okay, so did you see any... Uh, I mean, were you, you never bombed anybody. Oh, no, I bombed. Um, so uh, when I went to transition, to, uh, I, I transitioned to Tomcats after the A6. A6 got retired. Um, the last flight in the A6 was um, February of 1997 is when my squadron got decommissioned. And so by that year, I had moved over to Virginia Beach where I flew Tomcats. Um, so um, I went through the RAG there. Um, the RAG is replacement air group. Um, some people call it the fleet readiness squadron. That's where they train the new air crew in a fleet aircraft, okay. right? So, so they're not going to the fleet just yet. They have to get through the training on mm -hmm. the missions and how to employ that aircraft. So I was in VF-101 there. It was called the Grim Reapers. That's the RAG. And then I went uh, to a squadron called uh, VF-41, the Black Aces. Uh, so the Black Aces, uh, in 1999, Kosovo starts up. Um, and, you know, we go on deployment, and about three days after we got on the ship, we are in the Ionian Sea, south of Italy, uh, and we're running sorties up into Kosovo. What does that mean? Um, so we're, we are running 24-hour operations. Uh, we're going up um, the east side of Italy. You're and flying? Tomcats. Tomcats. With bombs. With bombs. Yeah, going into Kosovo and, and dropping bombs in Kosovo, right? Whoa. Um, and so Kosovo is sort of interesting because, you know, in the military, you never want to bomb civilians, right? You want to bomb military targets, right? You don't yeah. want to hurt the civilians. You want to hurt the military guys. So in Kosovo, uh, they were doing ethnic cleansing. And so the, what they would do is um, they would hand out flyers um, inside cities saying, hey, you need to evacuate. And they were taking the Muslims and they were taking them to their ethnic cleansing areas. And they were letting the Serbians go. And so... If you weren't leaving the city, they had their tanks parked outside the cities, and they would just shell the cities. So you'd fly into Kosovo in the middle of the day, and you could see a city on fire. And you go, oh, look at that city. He's getting shelled over there. So you'd start flying overhead that city, and we had forward-looking infrared, which, you know, forward-looking infrared, 15, 20, 25 miles away. I can see it's a tank. I can see the barrel. Fleur goes that far? Oh, yeah. yeah. And... and um, there were no friendly tanks in country. So if there was a city that was burning and we found a tank outside that city, it was getting bombed because that city was burning because the tank was shelling mm. it, right? So we did, we did a lot of that. And so uh, three months worth of uh, bombing in Kosovo. Um, that was the only time I've ever gotten shot at, like, uh, with missiles. I, I'd gotten shot at in Iraq. Um, I was doing something called a TARPS mission. That was after Kosovo and the same cruise. Uh, but... Um, I got May 1st, actually. Uh, May 1st, 1999, I got I got shot at by SA-6. Uh, they called them the Three Fingers of Death because um, they come in three three uh, missiles on a uh, launch pad at a time, right? Hmm. So we're flying over Pristina Airfield, and we're just in a big um, clockwise flow over Pristina Airfield. Beautiful day, clear. Um, you could see 100 miles, no problem. There's no wind aloft. Um, and so I was a wingman, and my lead was actually looking for tanks, right? And we knew there was a surface-to-air battery somewhere nearby. And so I'm tracking through north, and uh, Wag Carroll was my, my Rio. And, um, you know, we got radar detectors, and so my radar detector goes off. I'm like, Wag, did you see that? He's like, what? I'm like, I just saw an indication of, you know, like a SA-6 somewhere over here. And so... So your instruments inside the cockpit can see well, it's what... It's just like a radar detector when you're running, you know, when the police hit you with a radar, right? But so it can it can say, like, this is a XYZ missile coming at you? Like, it can label what size it is or what... Hmm. I don't know what I can say, okay. but I can say we have oh, a radar detector okay. on the, on All the right. airplane, gotcha. right? So, uh, Top secret. Yeah. So, so, you know, I can tell that there's something there. And so now we're flowing through south, 
um, you know, so I've done 180 degrees of turn, and all of a sudden my radar detector, just like you're driving down the street and a police officer hits you with a radar gun, and it just starts going high warble. And the little missile light starts flashing at me in the airplane. And so uh, I look off to the right. Uh, where, that's where Pristina Airfield is. Um, I look off to the right, and here are three plumes of smoke heading up my way. And so I'm at like 25,000 feet or so, uh, 25, 28,000 feet. I'm in a Tomcat. I've got four 500-pound laser-guided bombs on board. I've got all my drop tanks still on board. Uh, that's where we carry extra fuel. Uh, and so I start doing my, you know, avoidance maneuvers. Now, when you do these avoidance maneuvers, um, you're pulling Gs, so you're losing energy. SA-6 has a very limited ceiling. I was still within their range, but it, the missile can only make certain turns the higher it gets because it starts losing energy. So what these guys would do is they would uh, shoot a bunch of missiles at you to get you to come down because you're losing energy. Mm. And then they'd shoot one that was actually guiding at you, right? Uh, so sure enough, the first three, they pass. A couple will go over my head. One goes right underneath the airplane. Uh, and, you know, we've already, you know, called that we're defending and we're heading south. Um, what I didn't know was my backseater had already called um, the electronic attack airplane. And that electronic attack airplane has already launched a missile. But the missile takes minutes to get there, right? And so... Uh, so then this, this fourth missile comes at us, and it looks like a black dot with, like, glowing around it and white smoke around that because it's pointing right at you. It, you know, this missile does pure pursuit, so it just keeps pointing at you the whole time it's tracking. So by this time, I'm way down, you know, like 20,000, below 20,000 feet. I've got, like, 300, 350 knots, and I'm like, okay, i got to do a last-ditch missile defense. So, so what's the time frame of this, that this thing is chasing you, like— this Seconds whole thing happens in about uh, from the time that I notice that there's missiles being shot at me to the time that I'm doing my last dish missile D, we're under a minute. Okay. Right? So three missiles have already gone by me. Okay. And the fourth one's now tracking and, okay. and flying up gotcha. at me. Gotcha. Um, so we do a last dish missile defense. So these missiles are like proximity fused, right? So if I can get it to fly past my airplane, it's going to, my airplane's going to make it blow up. But I don't want my airplane to be in the direction that it's going to blow up. Okay. Um, so you do you do a roll around the missile to try and get it to explode underneath your airplane away from you. Wow. So so I do my last dish missile defense. Missile blows up. Looks like a big Christmas tree that goes past me. <laughs> and uh, so I'm like, okay, I'm heading out of here. I'm heading south. So I tell my lead, it's like, hey, I'm egressing south. I'm blind, meaning I don't see you. And then he says to me, uh, I'm at your left 10 o'clock. And I look over at left 10 o'clock, and I see a Tomcat is a big airplane. That's 70 some feet wingspan, mm. you know, 70 some foot length. And I see a Tomcat in a uh, right hand turn coming back at me. So he's going back to the place where they just shot at us from. And so I see him, and I know immediately what he's doing. He's going to go back and bomb him, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, I, I said to my backseater, I'm like, Wog, go air to ground on the, on the, so the, the FLIR. On the Tomcat, Tomcat wasn't really made to drop bombs. So when they put this uh, infrared radar pod on there, the pilot didn't have control of it. The backseater did. Mm. But the backseater can make it go air to ground, meaning it would cue to my HUD. So if I said to, if I said him, go air to ground in the HUD, mm -hmm. you know, cue to the HUD, he, he could make it so that whatever was in my HUD is where it was looking. So I'm like, cue to HUD. And he's like, are we going back? I'm like, cue to HUD. He's like, we're not going back, are we? I'm like, go cue to HUD. And so, you know, he, he cues the infrared to my HUD. We roll in on the on the thing. Again, I didn't jettison any of my bombs. It was a mistake, but uh, it worked out. Uh, so we roll in on on uh, the base of all the white, you know, the pu the, uh, the plumes of smoke that mm. uh, where they originated from. We roll in right there at the base of those, and there was no there was no wind. So these things haven't moved. Uh, so I roll in and I put my my HUD right there where the where the uh, plumes of smoke had originated from, um, and so uh, I'm like, there it is. And so I can see on the screen, he sees it, and you can see the scorch marks where the rockets had just launched, mm. you know, and you could see the um, the search radar from the from the battery still searching, you know, kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and so we pull off there. We don't drop bombs on that run. That was just to locate the target. Then we come back around, and, you know, these bombs you're dropping from five, six miles away, and they're laser-guided, so you know they're going to hit. Right. So we did we did uh, one run with me as the wingman, 
my lead had two bombs left. I had four. So we dropped uh, six 500-pound laser guided bombs. Wow, we. Yeah, I think it was probably an overkill. Do you have you killed anybody? I'm pretty sure those guys died. Okay, like <laughs> is like does the military keep count? Like, do you keep count? I don't keep count. Does the military keep count? I'm sure they try and keep some kind of count. I mean, you know, during the Vietnam War, they counted years. Yeah. So, but um, you know, it's, it's the one thing. Like, I Did you I, say ears. Yeah, they would cut off the ears and count them. Uh, so that's one thing. Like. When you look at like an uh, an army or a marine uh, infantry, you know, a rifleman or infantryman, um, those guys are really fighting. I mean, they're really in the thick of things, and there's a lot of bad stuff happening. If you watch like uh, the Pacific or Saving Private Ryan, and you see all that blood and guts happening, that's etched in their brains. Absolutely. And so, like when I when I fight, when I was fighting in an airplane, it's a big video game. Yeah, you're. Pretty I know somebody far died. Removed, yeah. I didn't see it. Right. I'm just doing my job at that mm-hmm. point. Um, and so we, we left and, you know, obviously he was super happy that we'd gotten the surface air battery uh, kind of thing and there, nobody else would be threatened by it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's funny because you start losing your sense of like procedures that you'd been trained in. So we go out and I'm like, Brian, Brian Brewrud, he actually uh, owns a company called Check Six um, and that does like motivational speaking, you know, from an Naval Aviator's perspective. Um he was he was the the lead pilot, and I'm like, hey, bro, can can you give me a combat check? I just had a missile blow up underneath my airplane, right? Mm-hmm. And so, combat check is to see if there's any holes or anything in the airplane. He's like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot about that. So he gave me the combat check, and we came back. We actually went back in country. We went out to the tanker area. We got more fuel, and we came back in uh, to continue doing what the mission was called Scar, which is really like, uh, uh, yeah, right. Scar. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's really like a uh, it's it's a reconnaissance mission where you're actually going to prosecute targets when you find them. And again, you know, in Kosovo, uh, they were ethnically they were doing ethnic cleansing. They were bombing civilians with tanks. They mm-hmm. had all sorts of you know uh, surface air batteries to try and protect those tanks out there. Uh, and we only bombed you know military targets mm-hmm. when we were going in there. So wow, that's fascinating. And we went into we went into one site where they had hidden airplanes um, inside um, inside a mountain. It was where their hangar was. We, really? And yeah, we bombed the mountain. <laughs> we had penetrating bombs. Wow. Yeah. My brain is swirling officially. It's a different. I'll tell you, it's a completely different life. And mm-hmm. I, the boat to me, um, the boat was one of those places where I would miss it when I wasn't there and I hated it when I was there. Yeah. And every time I'd set up to land behind the boat at night, it would be, what the hell am I doing here again? Yeah. You know? And so like when I, when I first started landing, daytime is fun. Nighttime is not, not fun at all. And when I first would land at the boat at night, you know, early in my career, I'd be scared right from the beginning. And then uh, later on, you know, I, I got you know 500 plus landings, 550 landings. Uh, later on, and you know, I wouldn't feel that fear because I was so focused on what I was doing. But as soon as I landed, my heart was just racing. Mm. I mean, just you know. But you know, you don't have time to really think about things. Um, a lot of airplanes, you you know, fold the wings up, you turn your lights off uh, at night. That's one thing people don't realize. You know, you see airplanes and they have their lights on. On a carrier at night, there's only two times you have your lights on. You lost your brakes and you need somebody to chalk you up, you turn your lights on. Or you're ready to take off, you turn your lights on. So when you land, you turn your lights off. Whoa. So just being on a carrier at night is sort of a dangerous environment because it's loud. You don't know what airplanes are on and what airplanes are off. So you have to treat every airplane like it's on. Wow. And those those engines, you know, they'll suck you in. Yeah. So, and no, I've never seen anybody get sucked <laughs> in. Other than uh, I saw one on, uh, I saw one guy that was doing a final check on an A6, and he got sucked into the A6. And luckily the A6 has got, um, it has like um, uh, stators, like the first, the first set of blades don't spin. And it has like a cone out there. So he hit that stator and cone. He fodded that engine out. The engine was destroyed. But he lived, right? Wow. Yeah. Ew. All right. Military, Navy. You retired in 2012. I retired in 2012. So my last flight was in November 2004 um, out of Japan. I was mm-hmm. stationed in Atsugi, Japan. 
um, did two deployments on the Kitty Hawk out of there, which if you're ever wondering what diesel fuel tastes like when you drink in the water, <laughs> you get a lot of that on the Kitty Hawk. <laughs> they retired that airplane, that uh, aircraft carrier, though. So that's 22 years in the Navy. 22 years. Um, the last eight years that I, that I spent in the Navy, I spent as an acquisition guy. So I, I transitioned over to be an acquisition guy, but always rooted in aviation. Mm. Um, so I was stationed here at SOCOM, and I was chief of training there. And then I went up to uh, Patuxent River, Maryland, uh, Naval Air Station. Um, that's where they do all of uh, naval aviation acquisition. And then I came down to Orlando to uh, Naval, Air, naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division, where we did uh, training and simulations for aviation for the Navy. Okay. And then did you go back to GE? Nope. Okay. And then uh, when I retired, I went to go work for a small business out of St. Louis, um, working, you know, tr competing for, and you know, we won some government contracts uh, doing courseware and training systems for, the, for aviation again. Okay. And then I started my own business. And that is? St. Moritz Enterprises. So we do... St. Moritz Enterprises. St. Moritz Enterprises, like the mountains yeah. in Switzerland. Okay. Only we're not like mountains. Okay. We're small. <laughs> we're more like foothills. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so I started my own business, and my partner is Mark St. Moritz. Um, and so uh, uh, we do uh, training support services for the government, um, and I also do uh, medical services for the government. Um, so that's what okay. we that's what we compete for. It's a different that's a different world altogether. Gotcha. I gotcha. just after after flying in the Navy and uh, you know I, I got to fly uh, an attack airplane in the A six. I got to fly the Tomcat. I got to fly the Super Hornet, and uh, uh, I just couldn't see myself flying in the airlines. You know, it just it seems a little boring compared to that. It was boring. <laughs> so now I scuba dive instead. I was gonna say you, yeah. you're missing a little bit of your. Uh, career here with uh, scuba yes. diving and charter boats so, and so i did charter boats i actually sold my charter permit so i'm not doing chartering anymore i'm only doing commercial spear fishing now okay so i got to get some adrenaline going every now and then right so i mean i know i'm close to arp but <laughs> i still got a little life left in me so uh, i do spear fishing uh and i have a commercial boat that i spear fish off of uh, but I just do that on the weekends or when I can because it's not my daytime job. Right. But it's a, but it's a fun job and it, it's uh, entertaining. So when we were talking about doing this podcast, you and I, yeah, your idea of it was not what we've spent the last no. 30 or so minutes talking about. No. <laughs> which was? My idea was to talk about the decisions that you make to get you to where you are. And so to me, that decision was after the earthquake. Yeah. Yeah, after the earthquake in uh, in San Jose when I was working for GE, and I thought to myself, I've always wanted to be a pilot. Right. And I don't ever want to look back and go, I could have done that. I can tell you, um, I watched the movie Jaws when I was growing up, and uh, that affected me for a long time. I, I would be afraid to go swimming in a pool. <laughs> I mean, you never know what kind of great white sharks there could be in a pool. <laughs> but uh, So my daughter, she said to me, she's like, Dad, you said when I turn 12, we're going to learn how to scuba dive. And I thought, uh, you know, I'm afraid of heights, and I was a pilot. And I got through flight school because I said, if that guy or gal can do it, so can I. And so I was like, well, other people scuba dive. I'm sure I can do it. And so, again, definitely afraid of going into the water because of sharks. Right. Uh, and so my daughter wanted to do it, so I'd, I ended up starting to scuba dive. Uh, and I was like, oh, actually, this isn't so bad. And oh, by the way, when you're scuba diving, you're blowing bubbles. Sharks don't want to be around you. And then my brother lived in San Diego, and he's like, you're, you're scuba diving and you're not spearfishing? What's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, so uh, I bought myself a pole spear at first, and then I bought myself a small spear gun. And I was like, this is actually really cool. And uh, I started doing that when I first moved to the Tampa area in 2005. I started uh, scuba diving and spearfishing, and uh, I've been doing it ever since. Well. Every weekend. Look at there. We came around to your topic. Yes, Finally. But, you know, so to me, it's, I always look back and I, I never want to be the guy that said, or gal, that said, um, you know, I could have done that. And I, right. just, I just didn't do it. So I'm a big proponent. I tell my kids, it's like, do what you want to do, but uh, try and do it the right way. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and it's okay if you don't succeed at, at doing it. At least you tried. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, um, 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Um, do you want to try to plug your business again, St. Moritz? St. Moritz Enterprises? Saint sure. Moritz if you have any kind of uh, courseware development that you need done, <laughs> medical services or training services. Yeah. yeah Frank up. How do they contact you? Um, you can just call me. What's your uh, phone number? 813-394-5077. One more time. 813-394-5077. Or you can email me at frank at S-T-M-O-R-I-T-Z dash enterprises.com. One more time, slower. Frank at S-T-M-O-R-I-T-Z dash enterprises.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here, Frank. I really appreciate you. Thanks for having me, Christina. That was fun. Yeah, Okay. Wrap it on up.